Okay, we're going to ask some questions from the audience. If you have a question, please stand up. I'll point to you. When um, you have a question, I'd like you to, you can address it to an individual person. If it's not addressed to a one person, we have one person from each side address the question. Okay, by you folks, and keep it your answer to a minute, because we, we've got a lot of questions I know. So this man at the microphone. If you consider the possibility of some crazy terrorist uh, loading his little small plane with dynamite from Boundary Bay Airport and flying down in there and smashing it right when it's loading, how do we stop that? For instance. For instance. <laughs> um, you know, I think that just becomes part of the planning process. Um, I think um, that's probably why we all get so frustrated when we go through airports right now because we try to put checks and balances to stop terrorists from doing that. One of the interesting things is though, and I am an ex-tanker man, um, I did spend time at sea on tankers, I would much prefer uh, any incident uh, like that to have happened when the, uh, when the tanker was full rather than when it was empty because that was proved I think in the Second World War quite a lot that when uh, uh, tank, full tankers were torpedoed, um, they didn't catch fire. It was too, too rich. They, they leaked, but they didn't catch fire. Um, I'm not saying <laughs> that that makes it any better, but I, I don't know, to be okay, honest. Okay, panel on the left, want to deal with the crazies, or let that one? Well, I, I, I would just point out um, that it's a very rare occurrence. In fact, I've never heard of one where windmills blow up, and the fact is, if you have a solar spill, it's just a nice day. <laughs> Well, if I could just okay. add one more, one more point to that, and just, just uh, you know, we have to recognize that that's a risk that exists in our society today, and and it's not something that will change because of the project. We have a petroleum terminal, we have other terminals in the harbor, and we have uh, regular tanker traffic in the Sailor Sea. Uh, not just our terminal, but the four large, four large refineries in Washington State get most of their oil from tankers. Um, so those exist, those risks exist today, and and it's not going to change because of the project. Okay. Um, yes, sir. At the mic, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm sorry, this lady in the black shirt was before you. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I really want to thank both or all the panelists here today for such a excellent, respectful discussion and for all of the audience for such a great response to uh, it as well. It was really nice to be able to hear both sides of the story. Um, I'm a dietitian, and so the salmon are very near and dear to my heart. Um, but I also drive a car, and uh, not every piece of clothing I wear is leather or cotton. And so I would have to say that I, I completely do, although I don't maybe respect the jobs that you're doing, I do respect the fact that we all do use oil. Um, my, I guess, dilemma as a, as a human being is if, if I could be 100 years in, in the future and my nephew's kids are speaking to me and they say, you know, why did... Why did you use up all this resource and why did you pollute all our land? If I could at least say, well, all the money that we made from it went back to find this awesome new technology so that you guys could have the quality of life that we had. But I think, I know my anger and many of the people around me, anger comes from the gluttony of the money that's made. How much of the money that is made from this whether from maybe the port or from the bumper cars for the tankers or from the oil, actually goes back into, into the resource development. Because my understanding is it's very, very small. And the majority of the, the here and now benefit is just so we can buy bigger houses and drive faster cars and et cetera, et cetera. So what are we going to say in the future of what we actually benefited okay. from? Because so how much of our, I don't want to be a hypocrite. How much of the profit now is building a new technology that's a more benign technology? I think you raise a really a series of important questions, and, and you're cutting to the core of the conversation now, which is about rethinking our entire growthist, globalist, consumerist system that is at the root of, of, of the discussion we're having on the surface here today. And these are just manifestations of those choices. And I think these are policy issues. And you know, until we stop subsidizing the oil and gas industry, it was our government at Rio this year, Stephen Carper came out of the WikiLeaks leak that we were the chief opponent to a, a, a global pledge to stop the, the subsidization with taxpayer dollars of uh, fossil fuel development. I mean, we're, we're, we're subsidizing car-based infrastructure in this region, the gateway highway project, the bridges. We complain about spending a bit of money on transit, 
but we're spending five or ten times as much on these these antiquated modes of transportation that don't give people the opportunities to get out of their cars and make those healthy, sustainable choices. Okay, David. so it is time that we start to think about that. And these aren't pie in the sky technology issues. These are ways that we organize our society and our future. It comes down to building public transit, relocalizing our manufacturing and food production, and those things will cut drastically into our okay. need for this oil. In your worlds, then, of piping of um of transiting and of tugging, it, or any any discussions to move some of these profits towards a new technology. Let's get out of this petrochemical-based life we live. Big subject. Yeah, it is. It's a very big subject. Um, I guess I'd start off by saying I, I think I think that the choices that you talk about, it, it really comes down to individual choice. I mean, I think the world would be a safer place if we all had smaller cars and smaller houses and, and drove, drove our cars less. Um, uh, the industry we're talking about is is is, is largely about producing uh, motor fuel, you know, transportation fuel, um, and uh, it uh, it provides uh, it provides uh, a d uh, satisfies a demand that we have as a public have. So uh, oil companies don't exist as something outside of society uh, to be vilified. Uh, they they exist to provide. Uh, 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 satisfied demand that, that we all uh, drive and they also exist as a, as a vehicle for investment. Um, uh, Canada Pension Plan, uh, you know if you're planning to receive uh, CCP in the future you're part of big oil. Um, you know the, the Canada mm -hmm. Pension Plan is invested in Canadian oil companies. So it, it, what we focus on is transporting things for people. Our company is about uh, moving commodities safely, and uh, so that's what we spend our time on. Uh, people uh, invest in our company like they invest in all companies, uh, whether it be for retirement funding or, or other things, and, and, and the, the profits from those are in the individual's hand to, uh, to uh, use as they, as they deem necessary. Okay, let's move on. i got a question. This fellow at the mic. Yes, right, right, yeah, you. Okay, um, first off, just on a human level, I'd like to acknowledge the people who came to speak, speak on behalf of the pipeline. I would like to honor you for coming here and what you probably, and you might be a potentially hostile audience. And I wanna just acknowledge you guys for doing that because I, I, I think that's admirable. Thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, I guess there's so many things I could ask, so many questions, but one thing that I think just, let's say, I've done, I've done some work in the maritime industry and let's just say we lived in a perfect world and the pipeline never leaked and no tanker ever leaked, which I don't think will happen, but let's just say we did. 300 tankers a year passing in and out of Vancouver every day, all of that ship movement, isn't that gonna just affect tourism? Isn't that gonna affect quality of life? Isn't that gonna affect sound pollution? in the water and on land. Well, just like, to be clear, it's 300 a year. 300 a year, yeah. 300 a year. 336, a according to Kinder Morgan's PR person. Uh, yeah, so, so, so I'm just saying... Well, according to the BC government. Well, okay. So just with that much tanker traffic, I'm just curious how... How is that not going to negatively affect Vancouver? So uh, the ships that you see in the harbor Keep today... I will. I'll do my very best. Uh, the ships that you see in the harbor today, there's a, a cargo ships that are there in bulk uh, containers. So they're not all tankers when you load it out into English Bay. Uh, today, uh, trade to our terminal uh, accounts for about a little less than 3% of the total port traffic. And with the expansion, uh, going from five ships a month to uh, uh, 25 ships a month, uh, it will go to about something less than 10% of the total ship traffic in, in Vancouver Harbor. So it's a small change uh, in terms of uh, the total traffic in the harbor, and it's a small change in terms of the total heart traffic in the Sailor Sea, as well as just, even if you look at it in terms of uh, tanker traffic. Chris? So, is Chris up? Sorry, yeah. yeah, actually, it was, uh, um, Michael talked about it. The, I mean, I think there's a bit of a misnomer. Um, in English Bay, those ships you see, they're grain ships, primarily grain ships. So they're taking Canadian grain um, around the world. Uh, because through the, through the port we have um, the, the tanker industry, which as Michael mentioned is a small portion of it. We have the, the coal industry, we have the grain industry, we have the container industry, we have the forest products industry. Uh, we have, there's, 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 it's actually Vancouver is the most diverse port in North America. And I think that's part of the issue. Um, everybody sees a ship out there and thinks it's a tanker. Um, we get about, I think it's about 30 ships a day into, into Vancouver. And I'm not, I, I want to put it on a comparison, not because it means it's better or worse, but um, I think Rotterdam gets 300 ships a day. So, yes, more tankers mean more risk of collision. 
but it's a perspective. Um, it, 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 we're certainly nowhere near what one would refer to as congestion in, in our waterways. Um, we have uh, okay. great capacity for the future. If we see fit, if our society wants to continue to, to, to trade in, in these various products. Okay. So I don't think that, that, that the increase is, is in itself um, large in comparison to the, the shipping out. Okay, thank you. A reply from the left. And the question was, this one ship a day, perhaps, as it grows to, will that affect the economy and livelihood of this economy? Well, I'm much less concerned about the number of ships than I am the cargo they're carrying. And I think that's what's different here. Uh, 350 uh, tankers loaded with dill bit a year passing through these waters. We, we've talked about those risks. And, and fundamentally, it is incongruous with our, you can be the greenest city in the, in the greatest place on earth. You can market that to the world through the Olympics and through multi-million dollar ad campaigns, and you can cultivate a $14 billion tourism industry. Or you can be a tar sand shipping port. But you can't be both, and we have not been that in the past. 20 tankers a year is not a tar sand shipping port. It's troublesome, it, it's worrisome. We, we, we have been exposed to those risks in the past, but, but tiny compared to where we're going. And what we're talking about is transforming the world's greenest city as we proudly market ourselves into Port McMurray. Okay. We have a question at the podium, I think, or the microphone. Or yeah. Hi, this is a question for Michael Davis, um, Davies. Um, my question is about long-term plans for Kinder Morgan. And after the twinning of the Trans Mountain, uh, does Kinder Morgan plan to have the second arrows dredged to make room for larger tankers and then also build a northern leg of the pipeline that would connect from Rear Guard BC to Kitimat, um, as was indicated in a PowerPoint presentation given by CEO Ian Anderson last year. So I'm wondering if those continue to be um, part of Kinder Morgan's long-term plans, if not, why? Um, and also, if there's any possibility that once uh, Kinder Morgan makes an application to the National Energy Board next year for um, a facilities expansion, whether you, whether you will ask for more than 750,000 barrels. Okay, we've got a couple of questions here. Sounds like a reporter snuck in the room, right? So the question is, is there, is there, um, um, are there plans, are there plans to drill and put Suez Max or other larger ships through the, into the Water Harbor? Uh, so as part of our application, no, uh, uh, and there's a number of things you need to add to that, but uh, uh, the rules in the, in the harbour today limit the size of ships to uh, partially laden aframaxes, and it's rules that are administered by the uh, Port Metro Vancouver. So it's not our choice, first of all, is what I want to point out. Um, dredging of the second narrows is something that was identified in work that uh, we did uh, over 10 years, uh, looking at the safety and efficiency of transits through the second narrows for the existing shipping. Um, and one of the things that was identified is the next thing to do after all the things we've done so far is to uh, dredge the narrows, to make it wider. Um, we talked earlier about 10% under kill clearance. The 10% is not under the ship. It's not normally the clearance underneath the ship when it's going through, through in second arrows. 10% um, is what defines the safe channel width. So at 2.85 times the beam, there has to be 10% underneath the keel. There's tens of meters underneath the ship when it goes through second arrows. Uh, dredging would be done uh, in order to provide more response time if something goes wrong by making the, 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 uh, the channel a bit wider. And not real relevant to tonight, but is there plans for a spur? Uh, in central uh, yeah, sorry, yeah. So, so um, you know, there's there's this project uh, and 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 projects to address West Coast access have been West Coast access have been around since uh, the 70s. Um, and uh, over time, there's different schemes that are floated in the market, and uh, they either get support or they don't. Um, uh, a branch off to Kimat is not part of our current plan. It's certainly not part of our application uh, today. Okay. Um, Thank I've you. got a yep. question just based on that, because my understanding is, so you, Mike, have just said that uh, it's only Aframax that are allowed, and that's the limit. The BC government technical report says that, in fact, there is no limit, and it could be Suez Max or VLCCs or ULCCs. Those are the even bigger ones. Um, but So I don't know what the answer is. What is the limit? So uh, about two or three years ago, uh, a feasibility study was done to see if the Suez Max could get through. Sorry, Suez Max is more operational jargon. It just it just is the next size of ship. So instead of a... So Aframax is 500,000 barrels, Suez Max is a million barrels. Yeah, I don't know because again, I work in tons, but, uh, barrels, but yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, so there was a feasibility study done to see if you could get, uh, what's uh, the largest size of vessel you could get through uh, second arrows? Feasibility study, I'm talking about, could it be dredged 
to allow for Suez Max? And the answer was, yes, it could, in theory, be dredged. That's as far as it went. It was then asked, in theory, could you get a larger vessel through? The answer came back, no, you couldn't. That's the only work that I'm aware of that's been done uh, on the feasibility side. So okay. there's no actual limit on a Suez Max. It, in, in, it's possible. A Suez, there's nothing to stop a Suez yeah. Max coming in tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, you can't, there's not enough water well, right well, now. But there's also, sorry, I mean, there's also... Uh, the, the, the harbor, uh, Port Metro Vancouver has a harbor operations yeah. manual. It's available on their website. And um, if you read through that, uh, there's a limit on the draft, the maximum draft of ships that are allowed to pass through second arrows, as well as a uh, combination of length overall plus beam. Okay, and you've that got restricts some the size of ships that you can come you got some homework to do on the metrics, all of you, to brush up on your maxes. Uh, no, you're done. Up, you're done. The, after the twinning of the Trans Mountain, I is there a possibility? Done. And that, I mean, I think that was the, the question, was after the twinning of the Trans Mountain, would there be a possibility of, of having the second narrows dredge? Well, I mean, what I can say is our application is for the project that we've described. So it's a twinning of the existing system. That will go for before the National Energy Board. Okay. Um, and that's, you know, that's what we're pursuing. The lady in the salmon how shirt. Thank you. Thank you very much. Salmon. Um, <laughs> um, so I, I just, uh, I'm... First of all, really grateful to be here and having this discussion with everybody. It's a privilege, really. Um, it, it seems to me that quintessentially, very, very quintessentially, what we're talking about here is a risk assessment. And what we've heard a lot of, what I've heard a lot of, is what we're doing to minimize the risk. And, and that is somewhat reassuring, and there's obviously lots of ingenuity that's gone into that. What I haven't heard much of is what are we risking and how do we assign a value to that? And at what point do we decide that we even want to risk it? I'll just say that you know Rex Weiler, who's a co-founder of Greenpeace and, uh, and, and it, a Pulitzer Prize nominated author, did a study, a very comprehensive one, looking at the, the economic risks to this region from an oil spill and, and, and uh, pinned that, pegged that at $40 billion. Uh, to Vancouver, its economy, the cost of a spill cleanup. And that's based on recent spills and, and comparable data and situations around the world. So um, in terms of a, if you want to put a dollar figure on it, that's that's one thing. But I, I think this is much more than a dollar figure. When you look at, when you listen to our First Nations friends who predate us here since time immemorial and, and the message that you heard earlier, and I, I think we should all remember that as we leave this room where they stand on this issue. And that's the Squamish First Nation, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Musqueam have all signed on to the Save the Fraser Declaration. Okay. And that's what's at stake. Good. Do you have something? Yeah, I, I just want to add that from MIT to the IEA, they've, it's very clear that if we are going to that these pipelines only make sense if we're committing to a dramatic expansion of the tar sands. So, in if, and if that's true, all of these those studies say that 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 will take us beyond um, safe climate levels. So, what are we risking? We're risking everything. Three hundred thousand people died this year because of climate change. And even if you're not just going to look at climate change, if you're going to look at local impacts. What are we risking? We should be asking the Athabasca Chippewan, who are in court this week, who are dealing with rare cancers in their communities, who can no longer hunt and fish on their traditional territories. We're risking the very things that give us life. Okay, question at the podium, or Mike. Yeah, yeah. part of the uh, requirement for life is air, and uh, Vancouver's air shed um, and Valley is notorious for the kind of compounding of uh, dynamics that way. I'm wondering, is there a threshold in terms of a spill and the potential release of volatiles because of the dynamics of, of the mix in the, the bitumen um, where uh, portions of Vancouver or portions of the Fraser Valley would have to be uh, evacuated? And I'm wondering how much oil or how many how much volatiles toxic volatiles would be released uh, or would have to be released uh, for you to pack up your kids and get out of the watershed okay anybody there um, well there's nothing good about an oil spill um, and a safe approach if there is a oil spill uh, involves uh, monitoring the air for uh, um, 
uh, uh, make sure it's uh, below a combustible limit so you won't start a fire, as well as uh, making sure that the air is safe to breathe. Um, you know, is, you, you've, you've given me a very open-ended question. Um, uh, I can't imagine a, a scenario where there would be large parts of the lower mainland evacuated because of a spill. But uh, evacuations can occur to make sure that people are safe. The question was, over, I think, just was about the metrics, which I can understand is very hard to do. How, 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 do, you metri how do you put some metrics to gunk in the water, gas out, people have to move? That's a, that's a, that's a big experiment. Are, uh, tell me what's going on now just in, in, in readying for this project if it moves through about what happens to that gunk when it does go in the water. What kind of testing is going on now as to how to recover it, uh, what it does do when it hits the salt? Um, well, there's been talking about properties of diluted bitumen. Um, uh, it's an area where there's, there's uh, work to be done. Uh, having said that, uh, the, 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 we've been moving the product in our pipeline since the mid-80s. Uh, we have a tariff on the pipeline that limits the uh, quality of the product. One of those limits is density. Uh, and, the, and the most dense product that we move in our pipeline has a 0.94 relative to seawater, which is one, and uh, sorry, freshwater, which is one, and seawater is about 1.03. So the point there is 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 that it floats, um, and uh, one of the questions, I guess, is is how long it floats for. Uh, the uh, um, when when oil is spilt into water, there's typically sort of three things happen. Some of it is dissolved into the water column. Uh, some of it will begin to evaporate, and the oil that remains will float on the surface. Um, if there's turbidity, uh, if there is uh, a lot of wave action, you can have um, parts of that oil start to uh, emulsify or attach to uh, uh, turbidity in the water, and you can get a portion of it that starts to sink. And uh, so, you know, the, the, the qualities of diluted bitumen, that it, that it sinks to the bottom, it, it's not really true. Um, if, there, if it's spilled in the environment, it will uh, float on the surface of the water, and over time it, it can, uh, can begin to sink. There's the, a fair uh, bit of sorry. Yeah, sorry There's a fair bit of science on this. There's a lot to be read about this. If, uh, yeah, well, I'm I'm gonna, gonna what, I was gonna, well, what I was going to finish is, as part of our application, I guess we're doing more studies on that. So we're going to there's there's test uh, tank facilities where you can take oil, you can put it on a seawater sea environment with waves and uh, testing um, uh, the equipment. Our experience has been is that uh, the existing equipment and, and and conventional spill response. Uh, techniques can uh, can recover. Uh, okay, pitchable. one more question. I'm sorry it's going to be the last one because it's now quarter two and it's the lady in the black dress. Thank you. Um, I came a bit late. I apologize if this question's been asked. Let me know. You spoke of pension funds and um, I think I've been reading the same studies as Sapora Berman, and my question has to do with stranded assets, because it appears that between the IEA study that says that any new fossil fuel infrastructure locks us into more than two degrees of global uh, warming, which is catastrophic, and the MIT study that says that if there's any price on carbon, the tar sands, the oil sands are no longer economically viable. And then um, the magazine, The Economist, which says that as the costs of inaction mount, that it's inevitable that governments will take action. Um, is there an in-company analysis of what happens with what we have to hope is the inevitability of a price on carbon? and what will happen to the stranded assets that are now being contemplated as, um, as projects in BC. Yep. A uh, lot there. Um, trying to think where to start. I guess in terms of our project, which is you know, what I can speak to, uh, uh, the, the pipeline, uh, the investment decision, the pipeline is modeled on typically on something like a 30-year return period. So a 30-year model um, for, for the economics of it. And so uh, the investment decision that's being made is based on that. Can, and, I, can and I interject a question? Uh, Does that model include the potentiality of a price on carbon? Um, so the way our, our business is run is, is um, we, uh, we, we don't participate in the commodity markets. We move things for people. And so uh, building the pipeline uh, is based on uh, uh, the commercial process when we went through earlier this year, uh, concluded in, in binding contracts for 20 years uh, for transportation on the pipeline. So the shippers that want to move uh, oil in the pipeline have signed contracts subject to NEB approval of the project. 
uh, to move for 20 years. And based on uh, the strength of those contracts, um, that's what the investment decision is based okay, on. I think it's an, I important to add that, that when we look at how the pipeline companies and the oil companies are dealing with that risk of stranded assets and the potential for a price on carbon and, for example, an international agreement on climate change, uh, they are quite clearly uh, dealing with it by trying to ensure that it doesn't happen. And we see the tremendous investment from a lot of the oil companies, um, and um, Kinder Morgan is is one in lobbying. We're not an oil company. Well, it, sorry, in in the industry companies in donating to conservative political pro, uh, okay. to causes. Um, the Republicans, of course, Richard Kinder was one of the largest ever uh, Bush donors, and I, I think it, it's important uh, to remember that, for example, in Canada. Uh, this year alone, we had uh, over 600 lobby meetings with federal ministers from the oil industry and related service companies, and mm, 10 meetings with environmental groups, for example. There is an undue influence that the fossil fuel industry is placing on our political system, which secures their interest, which is business as usual. Okay. We're going to have to um, thank you. We're going to close it up. A lot of big issues there. We're not going to solve them tonight, but I hope what we may be done is put some new information in your brains.